John Worcester is joining me in the uh, performance studio. It's the Indie Rock Hit Parade here on XPN. So now we're kind of moving into your life as a uh, professional, g getting into being a professional musician. Yeah. You said to heck with uh, taking drum lessons. You're going to learn on the road. Um, what was your first live performance like as a drummer? Oh, it was great. It, it was... Uh it was August 21st, 1981. Wow. <laughs> uh, and Hair Club for Men played um, a backyard party. Uh, one of my brother's friends, my, my brother's two years older, so he, he had a friend, uh, Jeff Patterson, who had a big deck in the back. So we played. And my memory is, I'm not sure if they played, but they were there. Dean uh, from the Dead Milkmen, mm -hmm. he, had a, he had a duo uh, called Narthex. And I remember Dean and the other guy in North X, Mike, being there, but I can't remember if they opened or not. Um, so that was the first show. And later I found out that my parents pulled up on the street just to listen to us. Aww. I had no idea. They were there. It was so sweet. And the next day, we all went down to uh, Liberty Bell Racetrack to see the police <laughs> and the specials and the Go-Go's. And Oingo Boingo and the Coasters play. Oh, my God. It's like the greatest weekend of my life. I, I, I graduated uh, on a Friday, 1984, started work at a toothpaste packaging plant on, the, on Monday. This sounds like a best show bit. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so so that, that was the start of my kind of adult life. A and by this point, I had joined a band that, that was kind of based here in Philly, Drexel Hill. Uh, we would meet at the Tower Theater to go uh, to practice in Drexel Hill. Psychotic Norman was yes. the band. And I got in Psychotic Norman through the Dead Milkmen, who had formed at, at this point. And um, they were friends of those guys. And so we would play around the city. We opened for um, the Minutemen. Okay. Along with the Dead Milkmen at, uh, at a place called the Opera House on Brown Street. So that was one of our first big shows. And then we made a record, a 7-inch, and this things just weren't really clicking um i tell this story because I, I i think it's funny i hope it doesn't hurt anyone's feelings but we would practice in our bass players basement and the kind of straw that broke the camel's back was when he didn't show up at his own house <laughs> for one of our rehearsals <laughs> yeah so uh, so um the excuse had to be yeah great i don't know what it was i think he might have had a good one i think he might have gone to new york to see the replacements that's a good excuse which is a good one so but by chance that day or the day before, my brother, who was now on a track scholarship at Wake Forest University oh in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, calls up and says, this band is looking for a drummer down here. And it, by chance, it was a band whose record I'd sent away for um, when I was in high school. Uh, I was really into the North Carolina jangle scene, R.E.M. Mm -hmm. and Let's Active and the DBs and stuff, and Mitch Easer. He pr produced this band, The Right Profile, and I sent away for their single, and I had a little correspondence with them. And it turned out they wanted a drummer, and my brother said, my drummer, uh, my brother plays, and m my dad lent me 100 bucks to fly down and try out, and, and somehow they picked me, because at that point, like, I was playing a lot like George Hurley from The Minute Menu, like, okay. like, kind of like, and so... They were into Levon Helm and Charlie Watts. So <laughs> can, I had, you, can you demonstrate? Okay, so now that we've heard a little bit of uh, Minutemen style, uh, so what, what were they looking for? They were looking for just like, uh, you know, rocks off, Rolling Stones. <laughs> 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 like, like that, you know, which I got really good at. <laughs> and, uh, so it took me a long time just to to strip it all down and and you know when you're a drummer and you're a kid you just want to play it you want to play all. everything yeah. immediately yes yeah. so, as fast um, as possible so somehow they i think they saw potential in me and um so i had to tell the psychotic norman guys that i i was going to leave before our record even came out so that this is january of uh 86 and i moved down there i don't have anything but i i moved down there with my drums and and uh played one show or, or two, yeah, maybe just a couple shows, and we got signed by Clive Davis <laughs> like five <laughs> months later. That's that's got to be like the the best like show jo time to join to success yeah. ratio. And, and like it was so weird. Like when I was probably sixteen, I said I'm gonna give myself till twenty to like make it, and somehow it happened. Mm -hmm. But 
it was a disaster. You know, we, we signed and we started to make a record with uh, Jim Dickinson. Uh, we did uh, a recording with him in Memphis at Arden Studio. Um, I think we were the record he did after Please to Meet Me. Okay. And so that was cool being there because that, that record is so great just to see where it was made and to be working in the same mm-hmm. place. And uh, But it was the mid-'80s and records were sounding like, you know, super polished. And yeah. that kind of wasn't what we were. And Jim was great, but he kind of um, – I think he thought he had to compete with the new In Excess record, which mm-hmm. he, he brought in one day to, you know, to kind of A-B with what – we were doing, and it just wasn't sounding like us, and so we stopped, and and um, we never got our footing again. So we we toiled for a lot, like for years, and then by chance we um, got hooked up with a publishing company, and the woman who signed us said, "I have just the guy for you guys to work with." And and by now our band, which had been called the Right Profile, uh, was now called the Carnies. Our uh, connection at the publishing place goes, "You got to." work with this guy, this guy Steve Jordan, drummer. And so S- Steve Jordan was, at that point, was probably best known as the drummer on Late Night with David Letterman. Mm-hmm. And just incredible drummer, pl- plays on the Blues Brothers oh, yeah, yeah, record. Yeah. And uh, so at this point, he had just finished uh, doing the first record, and I think the first tour was Keith Richards. So he, he co-produced uh, mm-hmm. uh, Talk is Cheap. And that was just the most... So then we go up to... New York to record like five songs with him. And it it was right after he had done that incredible um, Saturday Night Live performance with Neil Young, Mm -hmm. Rockin' in the Free World, just crazy, just the greatest thing ever. And I got to use the drum kit he used that night. And so there was just like all kinds of incredible mojo happening at this thing. And, and, uh, And I learned more in the five days I spent with him than I learned with any buddy or anything in my life it was just um, the greatest life-changing experience and he never really showed me how to do anything like I don't remember him ever sitting down and saying do this and Mm -hmm. but just his whole vibe was just amazing and he would stand out in the in the room with us and just shake a tambourine and kind of dance a little bit while we played and he was our our click track yeah Uh, it was just so great it was and I think I it's the best drumming I may have ever done too and well unfortunately it was 30 years ago (laughs) I bring that up just because that that was that was the most uh, transformative yeah, musical seemed, experience I've ever had. With any of these bands that you've mentioned so far, what was the first drum part that you remember putting together for a song oh, that you played on? Um, pro- probably a lot of super chunk stuff. Like I really, I really labored over a lot of like the mid period super chunk stuff when we were all writing as a band. The first couple records, Mac would kind of write everything, and you would just come up with a little part. But but by by our um, Maybe it's our fourth record or fifth or so. Um, here's what's it called? Um, here's where the strings, where the strings come, strings in. come in. Yeah. So there's a block of probably three albums at that point where we all just wrote by committee in my basement, and so there were there were a lot of songs that that were just like I really thought about them. I'm trying to think of any of them now because I I don't really I didn't really relearn anything to play the songs again. Like I, I never go back and and like relearn exactly what I played. Yeah. Just because I, I don't I want to have some sort of sort of spontaneity. But there was a song called like uh, "Watery Hands," and there's some Alan Myers in that. A lot of like disco, what I call disco hi hats. So it's like. <laughs> one that that i that i uh i remember but like uh in going back on a lot of these songs i'll hear where i got something from like uh there's a super chunk song called hyper enough Mm -hmm. and pretty much the whole drum part i i realized is modeled after uh this great english drummer chris witten and chris witten played uh went on to play with dire straits and uh, Paul McCartney, but he played with, uh, I first heard of him when he was playing with Julian uh, Cope. Mm-hmm. And there's a song of his called World Shut Your Mouth. Yeah. Which I love. And so Hyper Enough is just that like five times faster. <laughs> which that is a, again, not as a drummer, knowing that song, mm-hmm. that is a, I would describe the the drum part on that, especially in the core, the intro and the chorus is uh, relentless. Yeah. It seems like you put a lot into it. Yeah, hold your ears. Yeah. <laughs> <It> goes, <laughs> My goal 
goal is always to get little snazzy stuff in, but yeah. hold it down. Sure. You know, that's, that's what I look for. And I, I, I often feel like if I don't notice a drummer when they're playing a great song, they're doing their job. <laughs> <laughs>